Hey folks, I'm going to do a little teardown review and also doing a repair for this ATLP120. I forget if it's the, the Bluetooth one that has a couple extra letters at the end, but uh, this thing fell off a shelf. Uh, it belongs to somebody else and uh, it, uh, it kind of crushed the, uh, the tone arm assembly here, which is now... Uh, Anyway, it did, it did some damage, mostly mechanical, uh, from what I can tell. But uh, taking this thing apart so far has not been a very pleasant experience. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about that to save people some trouble. Um, there are a bunch of screws that come out the bottom that are Phillips. They look like number two, something like that. Uh, they do have these little brass rings around them, though, which is essentially seems to work as a spacer. I don't know why else they would do that. Almost like they had uh, a bunch of these screws that were too long, that were old stock or something. I don't know. Um, after you do that, you have to pry from the front. You kind of pry from the front up and then kind of angle it, uh, angle it upwards from the front to get the top off. Um, I also took this black metal tray off before opening the top, but I don't think you need to do that. This holds in these posts for uh, the actuator, the, the middle gear there, as you can see. Um, there's also, in my opinion, a really super annoying design where they've got screws coming in from the other side holding in this heat sink uh, for the regulators. And this, this metal plate is quite heavy, and so what they're doing is using the, the mounting, the, the kind of plate tray here um, that, that gives the... Uh, it gives the platter some weight. They're also doubling it as a heat sink um, and kind of weight for the whole unit as well. Um, in fact, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, well, the bottom's still pretty heavy too. But um, I, I refer to these, by the way, <laughs> some people aren't going to like this, but I refer to these as the poor man's, uh, the poor man's Technics 1200. Uh, what I think happened with these systems is the Technics 1200 patents ran out because they were uh, built in Japan in 1979. And so then Audio-Technica came in and copied most of the design, uh, making some modern changes. Uh, but what I'm seeing so far, I am not impressed with, folks. And it's not that it's like total garbage or anything, but these are not cheap. This is a $300 turntable at the time of this video. And, uh, you know, between 250 and 300, I think that's even on the used market. They might even be more for MSRP. Um, and I'm not, I'm not super impressed with what I'm finding. You have like weird jumper wires. Everything in here kind of looks like shoddy late nineties circuit board design. Uh, you can even just tell the quality of the, of the PCB of the, of the solder mask and everything is is low quality. You see it's all kind of like dirty and spotty and nasty. Uh, with poor quality solder, I might add as well. Um, I know it when I see it. I've opened up enough things in my day. Uh, and then of course the driver board is a single-sided <clears throat> with the uh, jumper wires. Never a sign of, of quality. <laughs> um, you know, you've got guys like this that don't have a heat sink. Um, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it, you know, I would expect something like this to be $100, $50, not $300. Also, uh, the ground for the base looks like it's connected through this spring. The hell? That's really weird. Um, tone arm wires are nice and thin with good, uh, good shielding there, so that's promising. And honestly, turntables are mostly mechanical, so maybe, you know... Maybe the mechanics are good. Uh, but this thing always felt cheap whenever I used it. Um, and uh, it looks cheap when I've opened it. So uh, no uh, no uh, uh, strong order of recommendation for me, especially if you can get a Technics 1200. But those, you know, those are still quite a bit, even used. I think they're even more than 300. So, you know, budget. Uh, is what this could be called, but a very expensive budget. Uh, personally, if I think if you're going to go budget, like really budget, um, you should just get one of these, which is an uh, Audio-Technica ATLP60, because um, those can be got for about 40 or 50 bucks on the used market, maybe 100 tops. Um, they don't have the adjustable counterweight in some other settings that this has. So, um, you know, 
there are some trade-offs. Anyway, that's enough for the review. Uh, oh yeah, one other thing I'm not really liking is the glue here, which is clipping in the feet. You know, you, just, you see glue and jumper wires and it's also like, is that, that's the oil for the motor, I guess. But still, why is it? I don't know, man. Anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and probably take apart this assembly, see what I can figure out. Um, the symptom it was having, by the way, after it dropped is this thing looked all bent and out of alignment. And then uh, it would start and stop the rotation depending on... Uh, but when, when the when the tone arm was not at the stopping point, like sort of in the middle, they would just start stop turning and stuff. So whatever uh, detects that uh, stop play when it gets to the middle, which by the way is a feature the Technics 1200 doesn't have, so kudos to that. Um, but when, it's, when it does that, it uh, actuates something. Um, also in the defense of Technics 1200, you wouldn't have this problem because if it fell, it would not, <laughs> ain't nothing gonna bother that thing. Um, I think it's solid metal all the way. Um, but um, yeah, anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna dive into this more. Oh, and one other big, big, big difference between this and the Technics 1200 must be noted is that this is cheapo plastic. Technics 1200, this is all rubber. It's really thick, really nice insulating rubber for uh, vibration dampening and full acoustic isolation. Anyway, more to come. Hey folks, back with this ATLP 120 repair. Um, this thing was a doozy because I had to repair the hardest part, which of, of, a, of a repair of a Technics 1200, which this thing is more or less a replica of a Technics 1200 in many ways. I think this was, anyway, um, this, this adjustable height, uh, and this is the technical term for this is the arm base, according to the Technics 1200 MK2 service manual. Um, always consult your service manual if you're trying to find out the name of these parts because there's so many mechanical parts you're like, huh, what is that called? Where do I find a replacement? I couldn't find replacements sold of these anywhere unlike the Technics 1200. It looks like Audio-Technica does not support their product with replacement parts, which kind of blows. Um, fortunately, there is a YouTube video user named, or a person making videos on YouTube uh, that goes by the name of Deck Tech, and his video helped me out tremendously uh, because I was really struggling with this thing, and what ultimately, I'll, I'll tell you what ultimately fixed it. Uh, one is get yourself the hot air gun, which is what he recommended, and get some WD-40 uh, up in these threads here, and do them in that order, right? WD-40 first, which means you're just burning off the WD-40, getting some pretty interesting smells. Um, and then also, um, I got myself some plumbing pliers, and I had to unfortunately sacrifice this part of the thread a bit for the grip, for the hand grip. Not a huge deal. You can, you know, I'm gonna repaint this uh, with some black acrylic paint. It's not gonna be a big deal, um, but you have, to, you have to grip onto something. And this thing was really, really, really stuck. And you can see just how incredibly fine these threads are, not those inner threads. That's for the plastic. Um, in a Technics 1200, of course, it's not plastic. In these it is. Um, but these threads, see if I can even get my camera to focus on them. Um, let's see. If I dim the light a little bit. I mean, you can just see those. Those are like, what, a millimeter per thread? Just the tiniest thing. So you can already see there's some little gunk and stuff in there. This thing also took a bad fall. I don't know if that affected the threads or not, or if they were already bad. But uh, yeah, I'm going to clean this up with some isopropyl, re-grease it, and we should be in business after this. Um, use some really lightweight grease, or maybe just keep the WD-40 as the grease. But uh, And then I'm going to have to work it back and forth, back and forth to really... Because this really, it shouldn't take a bunch of effort. Um, it's funny because unless you've got one of these brand new, and I actually did end up getting a brand new Technics 1200, um, and I kind of use that as my reference, but this is this is how easy it should go. I mean, it should be nothing to turn this thing. Um, but these threads are just so incredibly fine that it, it becomes a problem. Um, and I guess they did the fine gradation of threads maybe for precision? I don't know. I think it's a design flaw. I don't think you should do that, personally. I think the, fre I think the thread should be at least twice as coarse, and that'll, that'll save these repairs. You can see I cut myself and got blood on this thing. Oh, man. Blood and sweat, literally, going into this one. Whew. More to come. Hey folks, back here with the ATLP120 repair, the Audio-Technica knockoff turntable of the Technics 1200. 
Uh, this thing took a really bad fall, and I was not super optimistic that I'd get it repaired. But now I am super optimistic that I'll get it repaired because I fixed all of the really bad mechanical errors. Uh, damage, I should say. And I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Pretty pretty excited. Um, one thing you want to... I'm going to go in reverse order, putting everything back together. I'm going to explain the repair. Then I'm going to go in reverse order, reverse order, putting everything back together so that you'll know, hopefully, how to do repairs like this as well. Uh, first thing to note, um, make sure you have like a soft surface like this, like a pillow or something to put under. Um, a lot of these components are, you know, delicate plastic, you know, buttons and, and switches and knobs and things on the front. So you don't want to have too much pressure on those. And uh, I removed the really heavy metal um, plate that you'll see um, later when I put this thing back together. Again, just to kind of reduce some of the weight. And also, um, you know, make sure how to get inside. Uh, the big, the big issue I had when this took a bad fall, and of course, when these things, it's like some kind of law, they they hit the tone arm. The most delicate part gets damaged. Never hits like a corner or something. It's always the tone arm. Err. And so the tone arm got a really bad hit, and it screwed up the arm base. This is the arm base, and it screwed up. I don't know if it screwed up the threadings before or after. If, if the threadings had already been damaged previously, because I'm not the this is not my table. I don't own this, um, but uh, but the threads here were really really messed up. Uh, using the video from Deck Tech, um, I he, which was very helpful on YouTube. He's got some some videos. Heated up the threads with a hot air gun, and you you got to get them really hot. Uh, then put some WD-40. If you can move it just a little bit to work the WD-40 in there, that helps. And then I used a plumber's pair of pliers and unfortunately you do have to kind of sacrifice some bit of the threads if this thing is caught really 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 bad like this was i mean it took all my force to, to even turn this a little bit so uh so yeah i really needed to grip onto something and that's where the i'll be able to paint this with a uh, black acrylic though it'll be hardly visible when it's all done but uh that that was a sacrifice that was made for the cause to get this all working now and uh, so, yeah, I'm going to go back in reverse order, putting the tone arm assembly back together and and showing you how how it all works. Um, I'll I'll do maybe a separate video where I'll review some more. I've got some some gripes about the quality of this product, um, especially compared to a to a, a tried and true Technics 1200, which I'll, I'll go into another time. Uh, first thing, though, is getting your this is by the way, this is called the arm base according to the Technics 1200 service manual. So getting the arm base back together, um, as far as calibration for how far the threads go, I don't remember or, uh, on the Technics 1200 how to do that yet. I think it'll come to me as I put this thing back together. What I'm doing though is getting it to a zero position, as you see there, and getting this kind of flush, the two, the inner ring and the outer ring kind of flush, because that's what it, before I took it apart, that was the, the zero position. Um, and then I'm going to take this, uh, this plastic headpiece. I'm trying to think if I should install this part first. So this part, um, for those that might not be aware, this is the, the raise and lower for the tone arm. It's kind of a cool mechanism. Uh, there's a little spring here. And this just pivots a little piece of metal, which pushes down the plastic. Uh, or sorry, yeah, pushes down the plastic, which... Uh, raises it as you can see with the spring and then the spring pushes it back the other way um, if you need any grease in there you can always put a little bit of a like a white lithium or something like that white lithium is generally good for plastics wd-40 is good for metals although wd-40 is more of a rust removal agent and less of a greasing agent um, but uh, yeah i find white lithium is pretty good for plastics and there's a lot of plastics in here so i'm going to prioritize that um, we've got the lock arm for the uh for the tone arm, of course, and that uh, that survived amazingly. That's also a thing that usually breaks right away. And uh, so, yeah, I'm just going to go at this from memory um, from from uh, earlier today. I'm trying to do this as soon as possible because I don't want to forget, which is so easy to do, um, to forget how to reassemble things. Um, also, another reason why I like to do some stuff on camera, I guess I should have done the disassembly on camera instead of the assembly, but whatever. 
Um, there are there is a screw that holds this in, and I'm looking for the standoffs here. If you ever want to find out how things are put back together, you just look for your your, your threaded standoff if it's plastic. And looks like there's only one threaded standoff here actually, which maybe uh, maybe one is all you need actually. Um, getting this into the right orientation is a little bit weird. And uh, yeah, it looks like. So because of the way this slots in, uh, this actually slots in here, the locking mech for the tone arm. Uh, that leads me to believe that actually this piece goes in after you thread this one in. And I've already put some lithium grease on here. Um, what you want to do whenever you're re-threading is really make sure that it's a loose thread. Um, there's no reason for these things to be struggling uh, when you thread things on. Go very slowly when you thread and find, find where the thread enters. Uh, the two threads meet and like there's a there's always an entry point and uh, you know just go slow this is plastic folks it's not metal so go slow and yeah it's counterclockwise and that's where it meets there and uh, I, I believe this one actually is just supposed to go all the way I'm not gonna make it too tight though just in case I need to change that later but I'm pretty sure that stays locked in and uh, yeah, I'm a bit puzzled how this all works with the, the raising and lowering. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay, so yeah, that works. And so, yeah, this, this tone arm goes in here. That got bent a little bit when this got hit, but I think, uh, I think it's fine now. Um, I just kind of bent it back earlier. And uh, looking, looking pretty good. I'm not liking... One thing I'm not liking, which is, okay, the two, the this plastic was hitting the black metal bit, and so that means it was obviously too low. So this is the lowest it actually ever goes, which means, where's the, you want to look for, of course, the, uh, the white marking, which actually tells you where you are, this guy, and you want to start it, you want it to be at the zero point. So it would actually seem that the zero point is quite elevated actually surprisingly uh, unless I have done something incorrectly which is also possible um, I may have to yeah that's pretty elevated yeah that's that's too elevated yeah so I clearly ooh, clearly threaded this at the wrong point um, because that's a very very tall height that's a good that's a good question how do we solve that this is what happens when you're working things out on camera you don't know all the answers um, so obviously maybe this actually only threads part way interesting that that is very possible um, which would mean let's see And then, so what we want to do is we want to get this to a zero point that actually makes sense. And see, that one doesn't make sense again because the uh, the black metal bit is hitting the our gray plastic again. So the only thing is either this is unthreaded, but even that that's going to raise it too much. So hmm. So then the other thing that it might be is that this goes like so. Interesting, interesting. Um, so what we're trying to get is this guy to a thread. So I'm trying to elevate the the gray plastic here above the uh, the black knurled lip in a way that's going to make sense. And I think interesting.
So how do you do this? Yeah, there's no way to do it without having this elevated more than I can find. But there's got to be, because it's not elevated that high. Let's stock. Well, what happens if we leave it like this, where it's... So what I worry about is this this contact here. When you're trying to turn it and it not actually... There's actually a gap in there, too, between the two plastics. So that, that can't be it. Um, hmm. Might mess with this more off camera so this video doesn't become super, super long. We will see. Aha, okay. Aha. Um, what I should do is... Hmm. It's a really good question. Because, yeah, that has to be... I feel like it can't just... <laughs> this is so bizarre. Unless there's another entry point for this. Gotta be zero point and uh, there we go. I don't know why that took so long. I think I had to thread the silvery plastic differently. So anyway, this is this is much more along the lines of what I'd be looking for. The uh, tone arm lock is inserted, threads are at zero, and you can see the height is looks to be at zero, much closer to zero. Yeah, and then uh, you raise it like so to six millimeter, and it looks like it raises fine. So, yeah, that looks that looks nice. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the small screw here. into the threaded standoff that I mentioned earlier. Some of you are going to be like, oh, are you going to edit out? Why didn't you edit out that part with the, uh, the threading? And maybe I will, but if I didn't, it's because I also like to show in my videos how much work is involved in repairs. You know, editing is nice for saving time, but it also robs the person watching it, the audience, of the full experience of what actually happened. And uh, when you do these cut edits all the time, especially with 3D printing, people love to do that. It's like, oh, I made this in two seconds. It's like, no, that took you 12 hours. Um, kind of gives people a false... Uh, false understanding of labor that's involved in these things too, which I also like to avoid because that just means people don't want to pay anyone anything at that point. Oh, I saw it on YouTube. It was so easy. Very common thing. Uh, I am using a motorized driver, which I would not recommend unless you're very experienced with motorized drivers because you can easily damage threads if you don't know what you're doing. Um, look at that. Oh, it's so beautiful totally repaired and then of course I'll, I'll paint this at the very end ah, forgot to uh, uh oh I got overzealous here or overexcited oh interesting so this actually because this holds it in place it's important that uh oh no oh no don't make me undo it all again. This is why you don't unscrew things all the way until you're 
until you're done. <laughs> okay. So, I'm not going to do it all the way. <laughs> Just to the uh, the six millimeter. Mm hmm. And that's nice. Look at that raising action. Super nice and clean. Okay. Ah. So, we have to figure out the lock. And there's a couple locks in here. There's one screw that holds down. There's these two screws which go into the base of your tone arm and they go through these two holes. One is to uh, hold in the, the, the tone arm. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll save that. I forgot I have to do the lock, the, this locking mech first. And so this guy goes in here. And I sure would like to know how exactly this locks. Ah, because it locks into here. That's why. So that's the locking mech, and I'll do that last. Um, there's actually a C-clip for this guy after it pops in through the hole here. Uh, sim similar locking mech to the Technics, but there is another C-clip here at the base. And I'm really glad I'm doing this now and not in a couple days, even though I have a very busy day today. And so I'm going to put that C-clip here back in the base, because um, that's what holds in the lock arm, and then the additional C-clip actually connects to the locking mechanism. C-clips can be annoying, folks, but they're very helpful. Um, for this C-clip, the uh, the embossed, kind of not embossed, but the, the raised kind of smooth side, I believe, goes facing up uh, to make it flush against the plastic when it's, that it's actually connecting to. All right, so we got that C-clip locked in there, and that keeps this guy from falling out, this lock thing but it's not actually doing anything until it connects here. And you can see it's just an off-center pin that rotates. That's all, it's, that's all its job is. I'll zoom in here a little bit too so you can see a little better. So it's just this off-center pin that rotates. Okay. And uh, so now we've we got the C-clip for that guy when it's all ready. We've got the three screws that actually secure this whole base to our main plastic. And then we've got the two clips for our tone arm. So now I'm ready. That lets me know that I'm down to the hardware to put the tone arm back in. Just kind of process of elimination stuff, you know. And uh, the way the tone arm works, you want to, of course, be very, very careful with the wires. I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. Um, you want to thread the wires in first. They're not really threaded, but just put them through the wire, the big hole here. Um, and I should, actually, I should double check... Um, where the wires come through, because you have multiple holes here. And I'd be lying if I said I remembered. Do, 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 do. Okay, so we've got a pinhole. If we look here, we've got a pinhole at the top. We've got the, the pivoting screw hole. And uh, I, I'm going to go for the, the middle hole, actually. Um, even though there's another opening... Uh, on the left, I think it was just this large middle opening. And again, just go very, very slow because these wires are really thin. They catch on stuff. As you can see, it actually caught on the, uh, the tone arm lock there. And uh, just go very, very slow. Don't drop the tone arm. It's kind of heavy metal. Heavy metal. It is heavier metal. And uh, am I doing this? Aha. So as you can see here, this is why you go slow and you learn along the way. I did, in fact, do this incorrectly. The the pin here is for whoops, the, uh, the anti-skate, the anti-skate knob, which is uh, this knob right here. So that's going to control this plastic lever. Oh, I'm sorry, I take that back. No, that's going to control the, uh, hmm, that's a good question, actually. What does that control? Ba, 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 ba. Learning as we go. Um, so I do. I do know that that plastic clips on that 
gold looking uh, gold looking thing and I thought it was the anti-skate yeah it is that's the anti-skate so see that gold thing pushes on the anti-skate so that's how you input it and then you can see this other opening right here that's where the wires are supposed to go through not where I currently have them so I'm going to take this open put the wires through the correct hole and then we'll be good to go And this is why I should record things when I'm taking things apart, not necessarily the other way around, but, you know, you live, you learn. Remember that song from the 90s? You can thank me for having that earworm for the rest of the day. <laughs> okay. Make sure it's not the opening with the, uh, the anti-skate, and it's not. It's the correct opening. Going slow, going slow, going slow. And... All right. And I just have to redo that pivot pin to get it into the anti-skate. And now we should be in business, hopefully. Yeah, so you want to make sure that it pushes that plastic when you move the tone arm. And you can do this with your hand underneath it. And there's plenty of now there's plenty of leeway for the uh, for the wires that don't get stuck on the middle pin there and we're looking really good now. So now I'm ready to put one of the screws in for the uh, for the tone arm and so it looks like the the shorter threaded screw goes further in and the longer one goes further out cuz the threads are are deeper. Could be wrong about that. We're going to find out. We're going to find out. This I'm actually going to go really slowly and just going to manually. Just because this is really important. All right. That screw, by the way, um, is going to secure this guy after I. This is the, the metal shielding that the wires go through. It's a ground shielding, um, which, uh, oh, I think I got that backwards. It actually goes, I thought that went, um, not that this is a huge game changer, but, uh, I thought that went, that actually might go here because that way the, the lug can be flat flush, whereas here it cannot. So I'm going to go ahead and actually undo our, first I want to make sure though that I got this uh, screw choice correct. It would make sense that the longer one is actually for the threading the, uh, the ground shield. So yeah, there's the shorter one. Got that guy all in there. And then I'm going to undo this one since I'm undoing it. And since it's a machine screw and it's metal, uh, doing a doing a reverse is not is very very safe in, in pretty much all cases. I'm gonna go ahead and lock the tone arm now. But look, everything's looking really nice, super loose, which is what you want to see. Um, the raise and lower works great, and uh, I know the anti skate is working, or there's a good chance that it is, because uh, I can move it as well with the knob. And uh, anti-skate is one of those features that only good turntables have. I don't see it in a lot of turntables. Let's zoom out just a little bit here. And uh, now that I'm, I've got this assembly mostly put together, I'm going to go ahead and use the pillow to give it some extra safety. After that, I've got to feed these wires through our little grounding protection thing. I'm not looking forward to this part. This part is going to suck. Uh, and I might forego it for right now because I am I can always do this later. And... Because, yeah, i got to fit it through that one opening. And... Uh, 
it's going to try to come out, these wires are going to try to come out all the other, all the other bits. So what I'm going to have to do is actually get some heat shrink tubing. I'm not going to heat it up, but I'm going to slide it over these wires just to keep them all in one place. And uh, that's going to really increase my chances of getting this thing back in here. This is unpleasant. This is not going to be fun. But I think I can actually do this. I can reassemble absolutely everything else in the table and do this last. So, yeah, I'm going to save that for last. Uh, it looks like here we have a little rubber seal. And uh, I'm not sure where this came from. Uh, it looks like it uh, goes around our trusty tone arm assembly. Um, oh, perhaps on the underside of the plate here. That would appear to be the case. And it's just, you know, it's just some extra insulator. I'm not super uh, worried about it. But, uh, oh, I don't like the way this motor assembly just kind of falls out really janky. Um... Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is just going to go here for some extra insulation for the tone arm. It totally matches the cutout, so yeah, pretty pretty darn confident that's what's going on there. Take my tone arm very carefully. I'm going to feed the wires through, and we're going to try to get our lock mech now reattached. And it's looking pretty good so far. Let's go ahead and be a little gentle with this main board and the motor. I got a, I'm holding the main board and the motor with my other hand because it's uh, just kind of falls out on its own now. Oh, because the only they only secured it with one screw to the plastic. No wonder. So this whole thing is just kind of flailing about. Uh, well, that's crap. Um, at least we got our tone arm assembly back in. We've got our lock mech in here, so that's great. And I think we're ready to uh, to get our uh, three screws in to secure our tone arm assembly. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my uh, built-in light for the phone here, so I don't burn out the uh, overheat things. All right, so we're gonna do this nice and slow. These things have these weird little brass. Just super weird little brass. Uh, see if I can try to show those. Like these little extra spacers. These like little brass spacers. I'm not sure what that's all about, but they're all over this unit. And again, I'm not super fan of it. I'll say that. Oh. Oh. I just want to do this by hand because it's not liking me. All right, at least we got nice Phillips screws to work with. Um, I'm gonna change my bit head because, do I have a better bit head? Nope, I do not. I'm not gonna change my bit head, that's actually bad. It looks like a number two, but it's a little bit loose for a number two actually. Okay, and then we've got our last screw, uh, which goes in the, the bottom here, and this one has a little metal lip attached to it. You see that little metal lip? And then, of course, it's got the spacer like these all have. Uh, what's the metal lip all about? Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. Oh, okay. It's, uh, it covers... If you look in here, it actually, there's two openings here. And so it would seem that it covers one of the openings, which, if I'm not mistaken, is the lock arm. So I guess you remove this to get to the screw for the lock arm. There's a flathead screw. And my guess is they just did that to keep, like, little bits of food or something from falling in, I'm guessing. Oh, just dropped one of those little spacer things. Let's go ahead and fish that out with the tweezers. All right, I'm just going to drop the spacer in where it goes. How about that? <laughs> and then uh, get this guy in place. All right. I 
feeling good. Feeling good about this. So um, last thing for the tone arm, aside from this, this last screw, which holds in our grounding shield, which I'm not going to, the braided grounding shield, which I'm not going to do until probably off video later, because that's going to it's going to be annoying. It's not going to be highly educational. It's just going to be annoying. Um, so I'm going to put the C-clip in for the lock here, which C-clips can also be annoying, but let's see what we can do. Well, I have a camera in my face. I'm going to use my smaller tweezers for, or pliers for this. Nice. Needle nose pliers for the win. And then uh, I'm actually going to hold the motherboard here because now I realize it's not secured properly. God, that's so ridiculous. I can't believe they only used one screw. Um, so I'm gonna put the uh, the holding plate for this motor back in so I don't break that one screw and that plastic standoff moving this around. So word to the wise, if you're actually working on this, <laughs> it might make sense to keep the this large metal plate attached. Um, which I think is ridiculous because it just makes everything really heavy and um, It's not gonna make working on this thing any more fun, but uh, I guess the alternative is Either breaking the corner of your PCB off Which you really which I don't recommend uh, Down down here. I'll try to show that on camera this corner here, which is the only way it's connected otherwise uh, or unscrewing it and then having more wires and more motherboard sticking out. These are not great options, folks. But what you gonna do? It's not technics. Um, if we look over here, we we have our big heat sink mounted control, and then we have our region select switch for 115 or 220 volts. Um, it's nice that the the motor driver has a big, uh, I think it's the motor driver, it has a big chunky heat sink. So I'm going to put the, our big metal plate on here now. Big heavy thing. And I guess there is an opening for the, the select switch, so that makes sense. Also helps you with alignment. And uh, there's four standoff posts connected to the PCB. Again, not my favorite design. Uh, standoffs like that, you should have... Uh, Anyway, it's it's a weird it's a weird design. I would I mean standoffs on a PCB are fine, but when you have it weighted down like this and it's the only thing holding it on a really heavy piece like this, it's kind of like really really I would design it differently. Okay, so um, we've got everything aligned. There's four screws here that are different from the outer screws. Those are all these are all black screws. And uh, those are machine screws, whereas the outer ones are self-tapping wood type screws. Uh, my gloves are black, so I'm gonna be able to see this super clearly. Maybe if I zoom in, refocus the lens here. Those are the screws for the outside, for the outer perimeter of this. This is the screw for the inside. There's four of these for the actual motor. Uh, the, for the these are for the the standoff mounts for the motor PCB. So I'm gonna go ahead and put these suckers back in. All right, machine screws, you can be, you know, go a little bit slow, but they're threaded more accurately than plastic self-tap screws. All right. Once I get these in, I don't think I have to worry as much about, uh, I don't have to worry about that motor PCB falling out and potentially getting damaged. Plastic mount ones, which uh, and now I'm gonna have to put this thing in my lap because uh, the way this works is not great. <laughs> um, if you have uh, force coming from the bottom of it, it actually pushes this plate up because because again that motor thing is not actually mounted correctly. God, I have to have a better matching bit than this. Let me look in my. Let's 
see here. There we go. That's a matching bit. pH one. It's nice to have matching bits when you're, especially when you're doing these self-tap style screws. And uh, the reason you're hearing it kind of move about on the, the head of the Phillips is because I'm actually doing that on purpose. I'm not putting a lot of force down onto this thing. And so I'm actually, when it's doing those, those extra rotations, it's, it's very, very lightweight. And that's because I don't want to force the threads um, that are already self-tapped. They're already tapped. I don't want to mess with them. And of course, you can do this all by hand. It's even it's even safer. Um, but this will this will save you time, of course. Time is of the essence, especially today. I got some stuff I got to do. Here, a couple screws have gotten away from me, but uh, let's. Our tone arm's looking real nice. Let's uh, let's give it a little check here. Yeah, looking good, looking good. Yeah. So, gosh, because of the way this is designed, I think the only way I can hold this is uh, vertically, like like so, and just have a pillow under it. Um, it's kind of kind of crazy, but uh, Technics 1200 isn't that different in that regard. There's not a lot of great ways to work on these, but you got to be really careful you don't damage them. Um, okay, so now I got to reattach the uh, so that's that uh, that's that spindle. One of the things I really don't like about the design of that big metal plate, that black metal plate, is it's actually got this. Um, heat sink. I mean, I get, I get, I get what they're doing. They're they're using reusing the metal for heat sinking purposes, which is smart. But you've got this heat sink attached, and there's no removable plug on this side. The removable plug is actually over here. That's bad design. You should let people unplug it at the point of contact with the large heavy thing. <laughs> but what can you do? I forget why, but I removed this one screw. Oh, I know why, because there's a grounding cable attached to that. That's the other thing they left attached to this metal plate. I don't know if they did this on purpose to make it difficult to take apart, but uh, that is the that is the result of the decision-making process of these engineers. And so, yeah, there is, in fact, a, uh, a through-hole grounding lug here uh, going to the output board. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in here and so you can see what I'm doing. It's this little this little guy here. And I believe it's angled downward so that it can go over the the TO220 chip. TO220 is a chip package type, which is what's being used here. that in there real nice now. Bam, done and done. And then I'm gonna go over here, I'm gonna plug in the, uh, the power plug that I removed to do all this. Which goes the other way, this is a, looks like a JST, uh, JST5 plug is what it looks like. Maybe it's, an, I think it's an XH 2.5 millimeter pitch. Plug that in. 
What else? Looking pretty good now. Looking pretty good. So I think at this point, um, uh, there's just the screws for the uh, that bottom plate that you'll put in at the end. Um, those do have those silly brass looking uh, spacers on all of them just to make your life difficult and have more parts to lose. I don't know. Maybe there's a reason for it. Um, and then aside from that, it's just uh, it's just uh, rewiring the uh, the tone arm back in. Um, obviously, if you took it apart, I would highly recommend taking a picture before, which is what I did. So I'm going to reference my picture. But the wires go here. It's black, and then I forget what these ones are. Black, of course, is being ground. Um, so I got to get those back in this guy, which is not going to be fun. Uh, you can forego this, of course. Um, I don't think the it's doing that much, to be honest. And then I have uh, one screw for the through-hole lug there. That uh, that one screw, that silver metal machine screw that goes there, that holds that guy in, and then the wires run through that to that PCB. Once I do that, put it all back together with the with the bottom plate and the screws. I'm gonna be done. Give this thing a whirl. Get this back to the person it belongs to, and uh, they will be enjoying records again. Thanks for watching. Hopefully this was helpful. If it was, uh, you can leave some comments. I love hearing from people, if it helped you especially. I don't think this has been documented as of yet. Um, if, you can, if you can afford it, get a Technics 1200. They're much better. But uh, these are much cheaper. That's all for this one. Catch you later. All right, back here with round two of the Tec Audio Technica LP ATLP120 repair. Uh, so when I fixed the tone arm, that's looking really nice and seems to work quite beautifully. But when this fell, it apparently also broke the motor. And I don't mean broke the motor as in it doesn't actuate anymore, but bent the motor platter or the motor part of the the inner motor platter. I don't know what you call this. This is a weird motor. Uh, big platter thing and uh, it spins it works that's good circuit board isn't cracked or anything but uh if you can see here what's happening is there's like a little little tiny gap there and as i rotate this that gap closes completely to the point where this is rubbing against the circuit board so um i'm hoping it's not actually bent but that this although it probably is ever so slightly I'm just going to have to try to use some plying force to get it maybe something that would work. Alternatively, I might be able to just, uh, no, I can't remove that. That's part of the motor, part of the uh, the inductive motor. Pretty sure it's an inductive direct drive motor. Anyway, um, also taking this thing apart, man, is janky. Uh, you've got these, like, soldered or spot welded wires here. Uh, there's a lot of corners being cut in this design. It's, it's uh, frustrating. Anyway, um, just so you know, when, when you, it's, it's quite a quite a hassle. This is only held in with uh, with one very crappy uh, self tap wood screw into the plastic um, with a uh, twist tie kind of adapter over here on this corner. So you take that out, and then there's some plugs you can take out over here on this main board, but it's not going to help you much. You have to cut the zip tie, and then I'd have to desolder this black wire going to the LED switch because what the hell, there's no plug. They cheaped out. So there's just a black wire soldered here and a black wire soldered there. So I'd have to desolder that, and then I'd have to undo this spring and redo undo that wire as well um, to get to that wire. And then I'd have to cut that zip tie, and I'm just like, you know what? Screw doing all of that. I mean, I'll do it if I have to. Um, but I'm going to see what I can do because ultimately I'm just going to be doing the same thing. I'm going to be getting, trying to get under here. Actually, I can see the magnets and this might not be so bad. Actually, it does pry up a little bit. Um, and it could be what I'm hoping is it's not actually bent, but maybe just, it doesn't, it isn't supposed to go down like all the way like it is now currently, maybe. But I think, I think like this, this like other parts, you can't get replacements, which is just like, man, not cool. So obviously we want to get this to where it's 
moving freely. And it's still scratching a bit. I might see what happens if I just pry the thing all the way out and take a look at it and see what might be damaged. But this is this is going to be a trickier fix. I also need to be careful I don't nick any traces on the circuit board. But I think it looks like under here there aren't. Okay. So I got it out. Mm, it's pretty pretty nice quality motor actually. Got all these pretty nice copper inductors, inductor coils, inductive coils. And we can see where the damage is, actually. That pin is ever so slightly bent. That is really annoying. Um. Hmm. Because if there is any, uh, that really sucks. Because if there's any problems with this pin, um, you know, any chips or anything like that, then it, it could very well have some issues being driven. Um, although I think it's this magnet that does most of the driving, actually. Yeah, it's this magnet. But it is dependent on this kind of, essentially like a bearing to turn. Um, and it would need to be re-greased. Gosh, I'm just wondering if I could just get it on there. It's such a slight bend, it's going to be really, really hard to correct. Huh. Huh. Oh, I see, and the circuit board itself is... has a trace that it's actually using. Oh, interesting. And a Hall Effect sensor. Well, this is fancy. Um, interesting. That trace is probably used to help uh, do the quartz lock for the RPM. Very interesting. I'm just wondering what, ha what would happen if I just didn't put it down all the way. But I think the magnets pull it down still? Or what's, what's the deal? Interesting. Uh, scrapes a tiny bit still. That's rough, man. That's... That's annoying. Hmm. Gosh, that really sucks. Question is, will I be able to get another one of these? Probably not. There's no way to get replacement parts for this. Or at least not for, you know, basically the cost of a new one. Hmm. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Go ahead and pry this up. I should have taken a look at the, uh, the motherboard here. So if you're gonna pry it up, I guess this is the spot to do it, but you're not gonna nick the, the, uh, the conductor trace. Man. And there's a C-clip in here, but that doesn't really matter too much. Boy. Boy, I could try. I mean, I could try to hit it with a hammer or something, but I just don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> Probably some physical force. Man, bummer. And I can't even sand down the PCB because it's got... It's got this conductive trace around the perimeter. How friggin' annoying. Let's see, I'm going to try to wrap uh, something soft around the center spindle and then maybe try to pry it, bend it just a... <laughs> this is such a long shot. Bend it with the my big pliers here. I, I doubt that's going to work. But let's see. Hmm. 
maybe that did maybe that did something actually. Let's see. Hey, did that actually do it? So it's still ever so slightly off center, but it's not hitting the motherboard now. What do you know? That might have done it. Huh. That would be very nice. So this thing was actuating, it was just stopping because it was, you know, hitting the motherboard. And what I did was I wrapped this around the spindle and then put these guys on here off camera just a second ago and I just, you know, just a little bit angled it. I, you know, kind of eyeballed it to see where the where the tilt the tilt was. And so like the tilt's still there because I didn't want to use too much force. But it's it spins freely now. And that's that's all I need. Um, I don't think it's going to matter for playback if this thing's just slightly off as far as this this frame. It's still going to actuate, and that trace is still going to tell you the RPM. And as long as the spindle is centered, um, you're not going to get any issues with uh, flutter or wobble with the record either. And it is. It's totally center. We might have a good table once I put this back together. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do that now. Feeling a little more optimistic. All right. All right, folks, just showing a little more of this Audio-Technica LP120. And this is the wiring color order. Blue, white, green, red, black. Black is, of course, ground. And then you can see over here the uh, red and the green are your audio input signals because this is all just a pass-through. Looks like the white doesn't actually go to anything. And then blue is, uh, is another ground. Somewhat of an educated guess, anyway. Um, to get it through this metal sleeve, you just have to really squeeze it together, like like about that, till it's about that wide, uh, that long, and then uh, the wires should actually push through quite nicely. I was actually kind of pleasantly surprised that that wasn't really hard to do. Uh, there's a, of course, a screw that holds down uh, that grounding lug, and then the other thing I wanted to show was how to properly um, calibrate your arm base so that it actually lifts appropriately at the right notch. Now when you look at this at zero, you'll see this is basically hitting, the bottom of this is basically hitting this knurled uh, nut adjustment, this very large nut adjustment, um, threaded, let me just call it threaded, threaded adjustment. And it hitting that is actually, that is the stop from when it hits zero. That's actually how you know it's, it's hitting zero. Uh, kind of weird. I wish they had a better stop than that. As you can see, it also doesn't exactly zero. Um, if I remove the lock, the lock, of course, locks that in place. I might be able to get it a little more zero. Yeah, but it's locked all down there. Now, um, also, it should lock and not go past the uh, the, the other threat, the other uh, markings here in the back. And as you can see, hopefully, it will barely, barely, barely go to six millimeter um, before I start having issues, which, I mean, that's what you're supposed to have before it starts uh, seizing up, essentially. Really important that you don't push it past the seizing up period. You don't want to damage anything. What makes it stop when it's going up? Because if you, if you just keep going, this will actually fall out. This whole assembly will fall out. So what stops it from going past six millimeters? Uh, the thing that stops it is actually this C-nut, or C-clip, I'm sorry. So you'll see this, this little rod here will actually lower and rise depending on my turning. That increases the Z-height and uh, raises this. As you can see now, there's quite a bit of height when I go back to zero. So this is sort of your limit, your mechanical limit uh, for that. And then it's also, when you lock, it moves this. So when I, when I turn the lock, it rotates this pin so that it pushes this metal plate here into the plastic. And this pin is just rotating. And it's because it's an off-center pin. When you turn it, it rotates one direction. And so yeah, once it hits that plastic, it becomes harder to move. Kind of a weird locking mechanism, but there you go. Um, and uh, yeah, just a last note when I was, 
I put some new solder on these. When I was reheating this solder, it was making a popping sound, and it was actually it was actually like popping. Like you might have to have some eye protection because it's really low quality solder. Uh, what else can I say about this? Um, this should all be working now, so I'm pretty excited about that. Put it all back together and call this one Finis. All right, folks. I think we have ourselves a winner. Um, boy, I did not think I'd get this working again. But behold, and we've now, especially when I put the counterweight on. Oh, I don't have the head shell though. So uh, the other person that owns this has the uh, the cartridge head shell. So I'm, I can't play music, but I'm not worried about that. That wasn't uh, that wasn't an issue. Um, we have a fully working tone arm with a fully working tray, and you can see here by the light meter. I don't know if it picks up on the camera, but it's a it's a perfect uh, 33 and a third at a 60 hertz power supply. Um, and uh, yeah, this tone arm. Let's see if it raises. Yeah, it raises and lowers beautifully now. This, folks, is a perfectly working turntable. Wow, who knew I could fix that? Whew, what a repair. So uh, yeah, this is the Audio-Technica AT-LP120. Uh, most surprising thing about this is actually the poor quality of the electronics and the design work on the inside. It looks really nice on the outside, but the internals are not impressive. Uh, do not buy one of these, I would say. Um, get their, their much cheaper ATLP60 if you want a budget turntable. Or do yourself a favor, get yourself a used Technics 1200, or, you know, any other. There's a Sony, whatever. There's plenty of other brand turntables out there. Um, but uh, this is this is a knockoff Technics 1200, and boy, is it a knockoff. It, does, it is a far, far cry from the original. You cannot get parts for it, and everything is designed essentially to fail. Uh, I think over time. I don't see these lasting more than that ah, five or ten years, maybe. Um, obviously, this one didn't last a single fall. Granted, it was a big fall, but boy, did it mess it up. Um, whereas I think the I think that the Technics 1200 would have survived that fall. Um, and uh, my Technics 1200 has been working since 1979. It's pretty nice. I had to do one repair on it when I found it because it was uh, someone had like intentionally done some really bad stuff to it but uh, once I've fixed it it's I've, I've had it in my possession for well over a decade and it's needed no servicing in that time it's worked perfect um, I'm still doing some upgrades and stuff to it because I like to upgrade things but it's basic functionality is fine um, whereas this one mm, I don't know if it's gonna work that long just judging from the quality of the internals but it works now 45 works 33 works Start, stop, it all works, baby. So it's very nice to see this all working. And uh, the person this is for will be quite happy, I think. Catch you all later. Here it is working with the timeless music of Billy Idol. Oh yeah.